damos la bienvenida a las estaciones acá en los Estados Unidos y en Latinoamérica. Bienvenidos al programa. Hoy en el programa vamos a explorar de la mano de una experta mundial reconocida y singularmente calificada para hablar de cómo se concentraron esfuerzos para fotografiar por primera vez en la historia M87, un hueco negro a 55 millones de años luz de distancia. Comparativamente, la Luna se encuentra a 1.25 segundos luz de la Tierra. Este es el primer hueco negro que se fotografió en la historia y hoy tenemos con nosotros a una de las científicas principales de ese proyecto. Se trata de la doctora Ferial Ozel, que nos acompaña hoy desde California, en San Diego. Doctora Ozel, una cálida bienvenida al programa. Thank you very much. So nice to be here. Ferial Ozel es profesora de astronomía y astrofísica en el Departamento de Astronomía de la Universidad de Arizona. Ha realizado contribuciones pioneras a la física de las estrellas de neutrones y los agujeros negros, así como a la coevolución de los agujeros negros y las galaxias en el universo temprano. La doctora Ossel realizó las primeras mediciones precisas de los radios de estrellas de neutrones que limitan la ecuación de estado de la materia ultradensa, basado en su trabajo sobre los flujos de acreción, hizo las predicciones de primer tamaño de las imágenes de agujeros negros supermasivos cercanos en diferentes longitudes de onda. Nacida en Estambul, Turquía, Ferial Ossel asistió a la Academia Americana de Uskudar para la Escuela Intermedia y Secundaria, graduándose en 1992. Recibió su primer grado académico summa cum laude en la Universidad de Columbia. Al pasar un año en Europa, recibió una maestría del Instituto Niels Bohr en 1997 y trabajó en el CERN. Recibió su doctorado en astrofísica de la Universidad de Harvard en 2002 sobre los efectos de los intensos campos gravitacionales y magnéticos de las estrellas de neutrones. Antes de unirse a la Facultad de la Universidad de Arizona, fue becaria postdoctoral del Hubble de la NASA en el Instituto de Estudios Avanzados de Princeton. Es miembro de la American Physical Society y miembro de la Academia de Ciencias de Turquía. Osel recibió el premio María Gopper Mayer de la American Physical Society, el Red Cliff Institute for Advanced Study Fellowship, el Miller Institute Visiting Professorship de la Universidad de California en Berkeley y el premio Bart J. Bock de la Universidad de Harvard. La doctora Ossel ha servido en una gran cantidad de comités asesores para la NASA y la National Science Foundation, incluida la hoja de ruta de 30 años de astrofísica de la NASA y el Comité de Usuarios del Telescopio de Rayos X Chandra. Con frecuencia aparece en documentales de televisión en PBS, History Channel y CNN International, así como en muchos artículos científicos en la prensa popular. También ha sido portavoz de la campaña de alfabetización de mujeres Louis Vuitton en Oriente Medio. Doctor Rosell, this is one of those instances that if we were to read, uh, to do real justice to our guest and introduce you properly, sharing your exceptional academic, professional and social service accomplishments, we will have no time left for questions. So we have an abbreviated introduction, but I will start with the first question. You have been recently prepared to the brightest spotlights of the scientific and civilian communities uh, worldwide. It is an incredible achievement to obtain an accurate photographic representation of a uh, black hole. However, your story didn't start there. Uh, for example, uh, when you were uh, starting, I imagine there were very few female scientists back in the beginning. So how, how were those days uh, when you started your scientific career? So it, you're right, it has been a very long journey, both for this project and for me personally. Um, I was born in Istanbul, Turkey, and I did my undergraduate studies and my PhD in the United States. And in my field of astrophysics, theoretical astrophysics especially, there are very few women. And um, for this black hole project as well, um, when the first paper I wrote on the subject was in year 2000, so 19 years ago, 
and there were very few of us, both for, for the entire collaboration and especially women. So how were those days? They were exciting, but they were also challenging. Um, just trying to find my way and um, trying to find a way for the project to work. It has been a long time. We would like to start understanding why you start focusing on black holes nearly 20, year, 20 years ago. Uh, what was uh, its significance for you? And uh, ultimately, uh, why did you decide to take upon that challenge to photograph uh, such a phenomenon? So personally, I love physics. I love understanding how the universe works, how matter behaves and how the forces between elements work. And I grew up just being fascinated by it. And astrophysics in general and black holes in particular are a fantastic way to study how our universe behaves. Black holes are probably the most exotic things our universe creates. The largest pool of gravity around any object is, is around a black hole to the point that it basically separates an island away from the universe and behaves in a way that we can't see the interior of it. So if we want to understand how Einstein's theory of gravity works, if we want to understand what happens to matter, for example, like it did near the Big Bang, the formation of the universe, it's just a fascinating laboratory where we can study how, how things behave. So I was just very drawn to it um, from a physics point of view. I have a question for you. How did you deal with the scientific considerations to find the right black hole? For example, you skip one of them in our galaxy, the Sagittarius A, and you went instead for M87, a black hole 53 or 55 million light years away. How long did you look for an appropriate, uh, appropriate uh, target? So it is true that choosing the appropriate target was one of the most important elements of the experiment. And we actually didn't skip over our own galactic center black hole. We lovingly call it Sagittarius A star. It's towards the constellation Sagittarius. It's only 26,000 light years away. We also observed it along with M87. But Sagittarius A star has a smaller mass, so over its lifetime, it hasn't grown very much. And what that means is that it is also acting like a small child. It's a little bit more turbulent. It's like the things happen faster around it. Whereas M87 is a little bit more established. It's 6 billion solar masses, 6 billion times the mass of our sun. So even though it's farther away, it still looks big in the sky, and it also is calmer. Things just change um, just slower around it. So what we did was observe both of these black holes, and in terms of the analysis of the data, we focused on M87 first because it was a little bit easier, and now all our efforts are turned towards our galactic center black hole. Nine stations made the Event Horizon Telescope how were they chosen? What factors led to determine it was the, uh, also it was the right time to proceed and have them all work together at the same time? Uh, what preparations you had to make uh, in terms of equipment? Uh, we understand that even some of them, uh, some of the instruments had to be caped in gold. Uh, so you had to improve technology. There were a number of uh, issues. Tell us about those nine stations, please. Yes, I think it would take the whole program if I told you how we got the stations together, but um, I, your question is very important. Um, so what we want is telescopes that are separated by as far distances as possible. That gives us a better view, better resolution of what we're looking at in the sky. So basically, we wanted to scatter our telescopes across the globe as far as they will go. But we also had to rely on some existing telescopes. I mean, in South America, for example, in the Atacama Desert in Chile, um, there is a wonderful, powerful array called ALMA, the Millimeter Telescope Array. And right next to it, it's a, there's a neighbor called APEX. 
So we wanted to use both of these telescopes. In Mexico, uh, we had uh, the large millimeter telescope, very important site because um, we not only want telescopes across the globe, we also want to be able to see for the telescopes to see the source at the same time. So to work in unison. In Arizona, we have two telescopes, one on Mount Graham, one on Kitt Peak, but those are not enough. So when we had to extend the array, we wanted to go as far south as possible. So where is that? That's of course the South Pole. There was an existing dish and my colleagues put the, um, put the instrument on it to be able to bring that into the Event Horizon Telescope. And then we went as far north as possible to Greenland, to the Greenland Telescope and brought that into the array. So east, west to Hawaii, to, um, to Europe, to north and south, we were able to bring in all the available uh, millimeter dishes. So a dish has to be good enough to observe in the wavelength that we're looking at. And uh, we, we basically brought in everything that we could into this experiment. Preparing was uh, very important, but also to weave together the observations from each observatory was also a challenge. Um, I read somewhere that um, you had to have absolute precision, uh, do it with delicate precision. Um, I understand there was uh, even a hydrogen maser atomic clock, uh, the precision of one second uh, every 100 million years. So there were a number of uh, uh, special pieces of technology that you had to uh, upgrade and uh, uh, probably um, make uh, compatible uh, for to gather the information. What were those? Uh, what was the technology you you had to use uh, in all these stations? Yeah, we mentioned that in order to see the fine detail of a small object that far away, like the M87 black hole or our own galactic center black hole, we need a huge dish. And since we can't do that. Um, once we put these telescopes across the globe, we had to observe our source. We had to look at our source at the same time and very precisely record the data so that after the fact, we could get the signal from one telescope, signal from the other telescope, combine it, literally match them up wavelength by wavelength and make it look like it was one observation. And in order to do that, to, to be able to record our data that faithfully, we did use these um, atomic clocks, these hydrogen masers that, that give us very precise time tagging for each wavelength that arrives at a telescope. We say, okay, this is when it arrived so that we can look for that wavelength in another telescope once we correlate the data. So it's these instruments, it's the atomic clocks, and then the coordinated observations, basically to have good weather in every telescope, to have uh, per people who are able to do the observations simultaneously at every telescope, and then to say, okay, go, start recording your data, and then combine it. That's how the experiment worked. We will go to a short break, but uh, before we go, uh, I just uh, want to leave um, up in the air this question. You actually assemble a dream team of 200 scientists uh, that carry this uh, project. So when we come back, please tell us a little bit about what the skills you uh, had in that team and how did they actually work together. We'll be right back. I've been driving a truck for 40 years now. If people knew what I know, lives could be saved. Like the trucks can't stop quickly. It takes my 80,000 pound truck 200 yards to come to a complete stop. So I always do my best to give a lot of cushion. It helps when other drivers realize that and do the same. Please give trucks the space we need so we can all stay safe. It's our roads, it's our safety. Well, we were talking about uh, the team. Tell us a little about the, about the team. I know you have a central command, but to organize 200 scientists from all over the world, it is by itself a great achievement. 
Thank you. I mean, it's a tremendous effort by a large number of people. I don't think we can emphasize that enough. Everybody who made the instruments, who were at the telescopes, who made all the simulations and the analysis tools to understand what we're seeing. So once the data comes off the telescope, to be able to combine it, interpret it, um, see if it fits our expectations, People worked for many, many years, um, and we are grateful to have a talented team of young people who spent their entire PhDs trying to get one of these telescopes to work, um, young people who spent their PhDs trying to write uh, algorithms like codes in order to simulate what happens to gas as it swirls around a black hole. And um, so we put all of our heads together and um, we work together as, as well as a group of 200 people can. Well, it is by itself, that is amazing. Uh, once you uh, received the data, it had to be correlated. And uh, I understand some of the data or the data was sent to MIT in uh, Massachusetts and some to Germany. Uh, one of the things that um, surprises me the most it, that is that they, it had to be sent by a snail mail. Uh, we couldn't use the internet. And I don't know, they're probably pretty hairy to be sending that kind of uh, hard drives. But tell us about how the data was correlated and what were the challenges uh, doing so. Sure. Um, it's hard to imagine the amount of data that we recorded. Just the hard drives themselves weighed more than half a ton when it was combined from all telescopes. So that amount of data is just impossible to transfer over the internet, even with today's technology. So you're right, we sent them uh, via FedEx snail mail um, from the pole and everywhere, and it went to our correlation centers. And what the correlation centers are, are just supercomputers. Basically, we feed data from different telescopes and they combine it and they search for a, a little bit of a time difference. When did the signal arrive at, for example, the um, uh, ALMA telescope in the Atacama Desert? When did it arrive to Arizona? There's a little bit of a time difference and these supercomputers are able to search for that difference and then line up the data and turn it into a unified data set. And we did that with um, the data from all of the telescopes. You also um, had to make some educated uh, decisions because there was um, random information and you had to kind of understand how you fill those gaps. Uh, I assume uh, there was some uh, decisions to be made as to the color that uh, was going to be represented of the horizon. Uh, even your decision to have the size of a wavelength, all of them had to be based on experience and uh, uh, some mathematical formulas. Tell us a little bit about that unknown that you made it known. Sure, um, you're right. If we look at the this gas around the black hole at the wrong wavelength, let's say, um, the one wavelength that we can't see through, then all we're going to see is the torus of gas around the black hole, and we won't be able to see down to the heart of it. But if you go to just the right wavelength, which turned out to be one millimeter of, of light for us, then you can all, not only see through this torus that surrounds it, but you also have a little bit of light that's still lighting up the black hole. The black hole itself doesn't emit any light. We are relying on the hot gas swirling around it to light it up. So it's just like the Goldilocks story, not too much, not too little, choose just the right wavelength where if you zoom into the heart of the black hole, um, it's going to light up, but the black hole at the center, that, that signature we're looking for is not going to be obscured. And yeah, so that's one of the things that we did through years of computational modeling, try to understand how should we look? How, how would the gas around the black hole behave? 
So did every team uh, have their own um, decision uh, or recommendation and then all of you came together? Because uh, I remember hearing that at one time, you all, all the main stations uh, presented their findings. So um, you're right. For certain decisions, we had to put all of our different results together and, and really agree on the interpretation. For these other decisions that were made earlier on, there were very few of us who were working on it. So whoever had the answer basically shared it and said, you know, this is how we should look. This is the, um, this, these are the places that we should look at. And um, though that work was done early enough that basically, if you had the answer, you said it. Um, whereas towards the end, it was through a process like you said different algorithms, different analysis groups. And we said, okay, everybody, you do your own thing. Let's make sure that we are not biasing our results. Let's make sure that we compare it against many different types of models. And if we're going to say something about if Einstein was right or wrong, if we're going to say, well, how big is the black hole? Can we determine exactly the mass of it? then let's do it in different ways and compare our results. And it's surprisingly, we agreed. Is there a plan? Uh, you know, it's been 20 years and it looks like a long time, but it's only the beginning uh, because you have created a platform from which I'm sure you're building now. Are there any plans to add more telescopes, uh, to search other black holes or to hone in on uh, M87? Um, uh, improve their definitions. What are the next steps uh, that you as a team are looking into? Yes, definitely. We would like to take a better and better look at our, our, teles uh, at our black holes with adding more telescopes. So um, the, what I like to compare it to is like when you go to a doctor's office and they do a 3D imaging of you and this um, this. For example, if you're getting an MRI, the machine rotates around you. Well, we rely on the telescopes on Earth to rotate to get a better and better look at our, our source in the sky. So it's the same technique, which means that the more telescopes we put, the sharper the image we will get. And of course, right now we're limited by the size of the Earth. Even though it seems big, it's actually not big enough. What if we put a telescope or two in an orbit around the Earth in, in, in space, then we'll, our resolution will increase even further. So in the short term, our goals are to add more telescopes on Earth in places where there are holes in our image. And in the long run, we would love to develop the technology to be able to put um, telescope dishes in orbit. And then the, one of the bottlenecks is, of course, the amount of data. It's one thing to put the telescope in orbit, that's doable, but how do you get the data down and then combine it with the other telescopes? So there are some challenges that we're looking forward to addressing, but um, yeah, I, it's just the beginning right now. Well, I am going to go with your permission from literally the universal to the individual. Um, and I'm going to ask you, you serve in NASA boards, uh, you are, recognize inside and outside your uh, field and um, you really stamp along with uh, many of your team um, a historical moment how did that impact your life because we always picture scientists working in a almost in a solitary um, profession but all of a sudden you are out there in the front pages uh, worldwide how does this whole notoriety help you out, uh, impacted you? Um, it's been a few months since uh, the presentations uh, around the world. Tell us a little bit about it. Do you want the true answer or the political answer? Uh, the, <laughs> the, the very true answer. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, so it's true that it's, it's a different way of living our daily lives. I mean, we are working more in small groups usually from that to going to a 200 person collaboration was already an adjustment 
And from that to just being in the spotlight is another adjustment. Um, I personally love communicating science. I, I love what I do and I hope that our audiences also enjoy like what it what it is to explore the universe and what it is to understand how it works. So I love that, but it's I also need to get back to my real job. Like there are days I feel like um, I I still have a lot of work to do and the just the balance between communicating what we achieved and what we love and getting back to the okay this code needs to be debugged and this you know this needs to be written and just the the real daily life of it is a balance so um, I think now we're probably more in the balance stage thank you Dr. Ozell uh, we're going to finish with this question what do you wish you knew at the start of your career that you know now that would have made a difference early on on the manner you approached astrophysics and science? Wow, okay. Um, I wish I knew how um, collaborative effort was going to become more and more important. When I started my career, I literally worked on papers by myself. I have many publications where it's just me. And I enjoyed that, but I wish I knew that being a scientist also means being able to work with other people. And in today's world, so many different areas of expertise need to come together to make something big happen. I wish I understood that earlier on than, than I did. It's been a special honor for all of us uh, to hear from you and uh, we hope we reconnect in the future. We thank you for all you have done and through you we thank uh, your entire team of dedicated uh, scientists. Many of them we will perhaps will never know but we certainly uh, will benefit from your accomplishments. Thank you very much. Thank you, it's been my pleasure. Realmente hay poco que agregar. Volvimos a soñar y a creer en las posibilidades de mujeres y hombres comprometidos con la excelencia y hacer lo imposible posible. Hasta una próxima oportunidad cuando exploremos juntos el ADN de las noticias. Gracias.